afternoon. Last November, the American people gave the elected representatives in Washington an overwhelming mandate to rescue the economy from high inflation and high unemployment. That was last November. Today, seven months later, the people are still watching and they're still waiting and there's no longer any reason to delay. Two major pieces of economic legislation are now before the Congress. The first, an omnibus bill to reduce spending. A month ago, the House of Representatives approved by a 77-vote margin a long overdue and unprecedented budget resolution. That resolution ordered House committees to cut $36 billion for spending next year, some $140 billion over the next three years. And yet there is now clear danger of congressional backsliding and a return to spending as usual. Some House committees have reported spending cuts they know can't be made, closing, for example, one-third of the nation's post offices. One House committee claims to have achieved savings by eliminating daycare programs in the daycare program to provide suppers, but it also slipped into the change of the law to say that lunches can be served at supper time. This practice is unconscionable. The hard work of Congress in passing the bipartisan budget res resolution was not an academic exercise. It was a solemn commitment that transforms a mandate from the people into a compact with the people. The Congress and the administration together must protect the integrity of that compact. I urge the House leaders to revise the committee work so that it honestly and responsibly achieves the original spending goals. But if that proves impossible, let me be clear. My administration will have no other choice than to support the proposal of a number of representatives in the House to offer a budget substitute on the floor that matches the resolution they voted for in May. The second major economic item on the agenda is a cut in the tax rates that we promised the American people. Some 12 days ago, I outlined the basic elements of a bipartisan tax plan that provides multi-year across-the-board cuts in individual tax rates, and it is an essential feature of our overall economic program. A bill incorporating these principles was introduced last week by Congressman Barbara Conable and uh, Democratic Congressman Kent Hance. I'm pleased to report from conversations with senators and congressmen that I'm convinced there is a gathering bipartisan consensus for this tax bill. But once again, time is fleeting. Just to take care of the paperwork associated with the tax changes that would be effective on October 1st, we must quickly have the legislation on the books. More important, let us never forget the mandate of November. The people of this nation have asked for action, and they deserve it now, not somewhere down in a misty future. Therefore, I'm asking Congress today to live up to its original commitment and deliver to my desk before the August recess not one, but two bills, a spending bill and a tax bill. Only then can we say as elected representatives that we truly deserve a rest. Now, the first question, Dean Reynolds. President, uh, last month you told graduates at uh, Notre Dame that Western civilization will transcend communism and that communism is, in your words, a sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages are even now being written. In that context, sir, do the events of the last 10 months in Poland constitute the beginning of the end of Soviet domination of Eastern Europe? Well, what I meant then in my remarks at Notre Dame and what I believe now about what we're seeing tie together. I just think that it is impossible, and history reveals this, for any form of government to completely deny freedom to people and have that uh, go on interminably. There eventually comes an end to it, and I think the things we're seeing not only in Poland but the reports that are beginning to come out of Russia itself about the younger generation and its resistance to uh, long-time government controls is an indication that communism is an aberration. It's not a normal way of living for human beings. And uh, I think we are uh, seeing the first beginning cracks, the beginning of the end. Uh, Have you learned anything in the past 10 days that would support Israel's contention that its attack on the Iraqi nuclear plant was defensive 
if it was defensive, was it proper? If it wasn't defensive, what role and what action should the United States take beyond condemnation? Well, I did make a statement in which I condemned that and thought that it was uh, that that Ray, that there were other options that might have been considered that uh, we would have welcomed an opportunity, for example, to try and intervene with the French who were furnishing the nuclear fuel and so forth. I can't answer the last part of your question there about future action because this is still under review under the law. I had to uh, submit to the Congress uh, the fact that this did appear to be a violation of the law regarding American weapons that were uh, sold for defensive purposes. but. Uh, I've not heard back yet from the Congress, and that review is not yet complete. On the other hand, I do think uh, that uh, one has to recognize that Israel had reason for concern in view of the past history of Iraq, which has never signed a uh, ceasefire or recognized Israel as a nation, uh, has never joined in any uh, peace effort for that. So in other words, it does not even recognize the existence of Israel as a country. But I think the biggest thing that comes out of what happened is the fact that this is further evidence that a real peace, a settlement for all of the Mideast problems, is long overdue, that the area is torn by tension and hostility, uh, we have seen Afghanistan invaded with the Soviets, Iran invaded by Iraq, and that was in violation of a treaty. Lebanon's so sovereignty has been violated routinely. Uh, now this latest act, and I think that it is what it should be, is a compelling move, and this I have stated to the representatives of several Arab countries, a compelling reason why we should, once and for all, settle uh, this matter and have a stable peace. But in this case, can you say, was it do you think now that it was a defensive move? Is there any, anything which indicates that yet? Uh, no, I can't answer that because, as I say, this review has not been completed. But what I would have to say is I think, in looking at the circumstances that I outlined earlier, uh, that we can recognize that very possibly uh, in conducting that mission, Israel might have sincerely believed it was a defensive move. Mr. President, a couple of times in recent weeks, your staff has told us that you were not quite ready to make a major foreign policy address and declined the opportunity to do so. In light of recent events uh, in the Middle East and uh, in Eastern Europe, have you given ser serious thought to uh, a foreign policy program across the board? And if so, could you give us today some of the outlines of your foreign policy beyond your often expressed determination to stand up to the Soviets? Well, there seems to be a feeling as if an address on foreign policy is somehow evidence that you have a foreign policy and until you make such a, make an address, uh, you don't have one. And I, I challenge that. I am satisfied that we do have a foreign policy. I have met with eight heads of state already, uh, representatives of nine other uh, nations. Uh, the Secretary of State is making his second trip and is now in China and is going to meet with the ASEAN nations in the Philippines and then go on for a meeting uh, in New Zealand. Uh, the Deputy Secretary of State has been in Africa and uh, now returning by way of Europe. Uh, I have been in personal communication by mail uh, uh, with, the, uh, with President Brezhnev. I don't necessarily believe that you must, to have a foreign policy, stand up and make a wide declaration that uh, this is your foreign policy. I've spoken about a number of areas. We are going forward with a program, a tripartite program, dealing with Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, tried to deal with uh, various areas of the world, uh, both Asia, Africa, and uh, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, so, as to a, an address, uh, I definitely did not do one at commencements because I happen to believe, as I said at Notre Dame, that, uh, that uh, uh, it has been, has been traditional for people like 
my position to go and use a graduation ceremony as a forum for making an address that was of no interest particularly to the uh, or no connection to the occasion but just for wide dissemination and I thought that the young people who are graduating deserved a speech whether good or bad that was aimed at them. Gary? Yeah. Mr. President, if we return to the Mideast situation for a moment, uh, several of the uh, Mideast leaders, uh, most particularly Syria, uh, say that uh, because of the Israeli raid and the U.S. response to it, that uh, Envoy Habib's peace mission is uh, virtually uh, eliminated, that there it's, it's permanently damaged. Do you agree with that? And if so, why not? I hope it isn't. I know that he's still there and he has left Saudi Arabia now for uh, Damascus. And I think that he's done a miraculous job so far when you stop to think that when we sent him there, uh, they literally had the weapons cocked, uh, ready for war, and it's been several weeks now and no war has happened. Uh, it would be just further tragic evidence if this latest happening should uh, turn this off, but um, I, until he comes home and says I give up, why I'm going to believe that we can do it. Mr. President, how appropriate do you believe uh, is Israel's decision not to sign the nuclear uh, non-proliferation treaty and not to submit to inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency? And I have a follow-up. Well, I haven't given uh, very much thought to that particular a question there, a subject about them not uh, signing that treaty, or on the other hand, um, uh, how many countries do we know that have signed it that very possibly are uh, are going ahead with nuclear weapons? It's uh, again something that doesn't lend itself to verification. It is difficult for me to envision Israel as being uh, a threat. Uh, to its neighbors. It is a nation that from the very beginning has lived under the threat from neighbors that they did not recognize its right to exist as a nation. But uh, I'll have to think about that question. What do you think the proper role of the United States is in preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons technology? Well, the, our position is, and it is unqualified, that we are opposed to the proliferation of nuclear weapons and do everything in our power to prevent it. I don't believe, however, that that uh, should carry over into uh, the development of nuclear power for peaceful purposes. And so it increases the difficulty uh, if you're going to encourage the one because you have at least opened a crack in the door where uh, someone can proceed to the development of, of weapons. But uh, I'm not only opposed to the proliferation of nuclear weapons, but as I've said many times, I would like to enter into negotiations leading toward a definite, verifiable reduction of strategic nuclear weapons worldwide. Uh, I'd, I'd better abandon the front row here for a, for a minute. Yes. Mr. President, at a recent White House meeting, Senator Edward Kennedy asked that you refuse to lead the fight against his legislation on handgun control or Saturday night special sales of Saturday night specials. What was your answer? That would I that lead the fight against his? No. Not oh. against his legislation. What was your answer? Well, I, we had a very nice talk, and I told him that I believed that some of the things that we had tried in California uh, served better, and that is to make the penalties for the carrying of a weapon, particularly in the commission of a crime, uh, much stiffer than they are. Uh, California, we added five to 15 years to the prison sentence for anyone carrying a gun in the commission of a crime, convicted of that crime, whether they use the gun or not. And since of that's, been, that's been augmented to include no probation, mandatory prison sentence. Um, I believe in that because the truth of the, my, my concern about gun control is that it's taking our eyes off what might be the real answers uh, to crime. It's diverting our attention. There are today more than 20,000 gun control laws in effect, federal, state, and local, in the United States. Indeed, some of the stiffest gun control laws in the nation are right here in the district, and they didn't seem to prevent a fellow a few weeks ago from carrying one down by the Hilton Hotel. Uh, in other words, they are 
virtually unenforceable. So I would like to see us directing our attention to what, is, what has caused us to have the crime that continues to increase as it has and is one of our major problems in the country today. And right there. No, no, there. No, there. The gentleman. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Su causa es mi causa. Su casa es mi casa. I wonder when I will be able to tell to the undocumented aliens in this country the same word. You talked to Lope Portillo the other day and he said that we are go you are going to agree in order to give some opportunity to those undocumented workers. I would like that you clarify to the nation what is the status of this situation. Well, if I understand your question, that uh, are you talking about uh, call it visiting the White House or me visiting you? <laughs> uh, I, uh, either way, it would be a pleasure. <laughs> All right, Sam. <laughs> Mr. President, every president since Dwight Eisenhower seems to believe that if uh, the Soviet Union and the United States actually get into a shooting war, say in Europe, can't be contained, that it would spread to a thermonuclear war. Do you agree? Well, it's a frightening, it's a frightening possibility and history bears it out. Uh, the only, if we want to look for one uh, little bit of optimism any place, the only time that I can recall in history that a weapon uh, possessed by uh, both sides was never used uh, was in World War II, the use of poison gas. And uh, uh, possibly it was because the weapon was available to both sides. But uh, the weapons are there, and they do extend to the battlefield use as well, the uh, tactical weapons as well as the strategic. And I have to believe that our greatest goal must be peace. And I also happen to believe that that will come through our maintaining enough strength uh, that uh, we can, can keep the peace. I ask the question because I suppose that your defense strategy depends on whether you think uh, if the Soviets invade Western Europe, a tactical nuclear war could be fought there and contained, or whether you think that it would spread inevitably to a thermonuclear exchange. What do you think? <laughs> well, you're, I, I thought I answered it. I try to be optimistic and think that the threat of both sides um, would keep it from, from happening, and yet at the same time, as I say, history seems to be against that, that uh, there comes a moment in desperation when one side tries to get an advantage over the other. Uh, President, about 10 days ago, your chief of staff <coughs> said on a television interview program that he thought you, you were committed to running for a second term. And uh, another aide of yours, Lynn Nostiger, has said virtually the same thing. Can you tell us, sir, if you are committed to running for a second term? I think that having only been here five months, no one should be making a decision about what they're going to do uh, uh, three years and seven months from now. Well, can you tell us why your aides are <clears throat> making such statements in public? Is it to prevent you being regarded at this stage as a, as a possible lame duck? No, but I've neither ruled in or ruled out whether I would run again. And it's something that for the first four years in Sacramento, I always refused to answer about. One of the reasons I refuse to answer is because I myself am determined that any decisions that we make uh, in this administration are not going to be made based on whether they might have an effect on a coming election. Uh, there will be no political ramifications to them. but. Um, I'll make that decision uh, when we get closer to that. Actually, I suppose what I'm saying is the people make that decision. They let you know whether you're going to run again or whether you should or not. For months you said you wouldn't modify your tax cut plan, and then you did. And when the business community vociferously complained, you changed your plan again. I just wondered whether Congress and other special interest groups might get the message that if they yelled and screamed loud enough, you might modify your tax plan again. No, the three-year across-the-board spread, which I did modify to the extent of making it 5-10-10 instead of 10-10-10, and which I moved up to October 1st instead of retroactive uh, back through the year in going into effect, was done in an effort to create, as we did with the spending law, a bipartisan package. 
And the suggestions that were offered in the negotiations that led to that were suggestions that I had to admit were good ones, the marriage penalty tax, the making it possible for uh, workers to save money for their own retirement and uh, have an income tax break uh, for that reason, the adjustment of the investment uh, funds, the 70 percent ceiling to 50 and so forth. All of these things I thought were worth and to put them into the bill. They were all things and that including the estate tax, which you've heard me in the campaign say many times uh, I wanted to eventually eliminate. All of those were things that we had said would be in a second tax package when we could do it. By making the change that I made in that across the board cut, that provided most of the revenue that made it possible for, to move those up into the first. I, I can't retreat and I don't think the people want us to. The latest polls that we have show that 79 percent of the people approve of the individual tax cut and approve of it over a three-year span. And uh, that, I think, should be a message to anyone who's elected to office uh, in the Hill or elsewhere. Uh, and if there was a gentleman there. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, your administration, to some extent, has been called an administration or a presidency of the wealthy. I'm wondering if you have laid out any programs in your administration currently that will provide for increasing the viability of minority business and other programs that relate to business development for minorities. All of these things that you just mentioned there, increasing the viability of minority business and so forth, all of these are matters of the policy of an administration and what we intend to do. Uh, I've heard these charges uh, uh, about our supposedly being uh, an administration for the wealthy. Uh, I don't see where they fit. We have watched the so-called social reforms for three or four decades now fail in trying to lift people that are not in the mainstream and that don't have their foot on the ladder of opportunity, and they failed. As a matter of fact, what they've created is a kind of bondage in which the people are made subservient to the government that is handing out the largest, and the only people who prosper from them is that large bureaucracy that administers them. And I believe that our economic package is aimed at stimulating the economy, providing incentive, increasing productivity so as to create new jobs, and those jobs will make it possible for those people who are now economically below the norm to get a foot on the ladder and improve themselves. And as some of the other programs, that is a case of how you direct uh, the administering of the program, such as aid to small business. And I would think, uh, for one, the minority community and the black community has the most to gain from the development of small business within their neighborhoods. If you will compare those communities to other ethnic communities of various kinds, you will find that the money that is spent in those communities almost from the first dollar, there is no turnover, it is spent outside that community. In the others, the dollars turn over as much as five and six times before they leave that community and go out into the general economy. And it is that turnover that multiplies the effect. And right now, the black community has about $140 billion that is not basically, even from the first dollar, being spent in their own communities. So this is one of the big targets, is to have an improvement of business there. I got to come to this side again. As you know, as you know, the Israeli government has uh, made the threat that it might take military action to wipe out the Syrian missiles in Lebanon. If that were to be done against our wishes, would you consider that a violation of the terms of the laws under which the Israelis have obtained those weapons? Well, this was going to be one I. I'm afraid that I can't answer now as to how I would hate to see this happen. Um, the, they are offensive weapons. There's no question about uh, the direction in which they're, they're aimed. I'm speaking now of the, of the Syrian weapons. Uh, this would end our prospects for trying to bring peace to, to Lebanon, I know. Uh, I'm just, uh, we're going to use every effort we can to see uh, that they, on either side, 
that there isn't a firing of those of those missiles. Um, no. no, in no, no, the young lady next to you. Thank you, Mr. President. As everyone knows, this is your first news conference since you were shot, and I think everybody uh, has the impression that you have fully recovered. My first question is, have you fully recovered? And secondly, can you tell us how having been shot has changed you? Have you become more cautious, or are there any differences? Uh, I have recovered. I feel fine, and uh, uh, the doctors say I've recovered, so... If I'm a medical miracle, I'm a happy one. Uh, the, no, you can't spend your life uh, worrying about that. Uh, uh, I'm quite sure that there will be uh, and have been changes in, uh, I look back now and wonder why it didn't happen 30 times before, uh, changes in uh, uh, alertness uh, on the part of security and so forth. Uh, but it hasn't made uh, too much of a change in in how we do, and I still want to be able to see the people and and uh, and meet them. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Secretary Haig, as you know, announced in China today that the United States is lifting its ban against legal lethal weapon sales to the People's Republic of China. I want to know if you would explain to the American people, please, why you decided to help the People's Republic of China rearm militarily, and how you think the Soviet Union will react to your action. Well, I don't know how the Soviet Union will react, but all we have done is uh, move the People's Republic of China. We've wanted, to, as I've said for a long time, to improve relations with them, move them to the same status of uh, many other countries and not necessarily military allies of ours in uh, making certain technology and defensive uh, weapons uh, available to them. And I think this is a normal part of the process of improving our relations there. Yes. President, do you approve of conservative fundraising groups such as NITPAC making these expenses, expensive television commercials targeting liberal Democrats for a defeat in the next election? I don't really know how to answer that uh, because the game of politics is uh, trying to win an election. And I've never seen a time when both parties have not been doing everything they can uh, uh, to win an election, I think one of the things that uh, does not set too well with me is that to campaign before there is um, uh, a candidate on your side means that you're campaigning totally in a negative uh, way. And I've always believed that you campaign by stressing what what it is your candidate would do and that your approval of it. Up on that, sir, is it really a sense of fair play that these groups, with all their money, are in effect ganging up on one uh, member of Congress to make him an object lesson for other wavering congressmen who might not see things their way? Well, I thought they were going after a gang of them. I, <laughs> just one won't do as much good. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, you said earlier that you strongly oppose the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Yet at the same time, you are asking Congress to waive an American law so that Pakistan, which has refused to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, can receive $3 billion in American aid. Uh, have, do we have any assurances from Pakistan that they will not seek to build an, uh, an, uh, an atomic bomb? Let me just say with regard to Pakistan, and I won't uh, answer the, the last part of the question, Pakistan has long has had we have had a long time treaty uh, with Pakistan and a mutual aid uh, pact. But Pakistan is also in a very strategic position now in view of what has happened to Afghanistan. And uh, I believe it is in our best interest uh, to be supportive of Pakistan. Yeah. Mr. President, sir, I wonder, you don't want inferior schools for soldiers, do you? Inferior <laughs> schools for soldiers? No. Oh, that children. Oh, that children. No. Well, I didn't think you would. Uh, the, I call your attention to what's happening to the school impacted aid program under your reductions. And uh, you're going to have some schools near military bases that are supposed to educate the children of soldiers that are going to be in a very hard hit way unless some new formula. I was wondering if you couldn't find a new formula for taking care of the children of the poor soldiers. Well, Ms. McLennan, I think what you're going to find is this is one of the things I talked about in my opening statement. Uh, this is one of the things in the committee, 
in Congress uh, that has been a cut that we did not put in our program while we were going to reduce impacted aid in those areas where the impacted aid is, is for, like a military base where the people are not taxpayers, not property owners, where they come in temporarily and their children then are put as an added burden on the local system. But we have been having impacted aid for a long time to areas where the people are permanent residents, but government employees, but they are homeowners and they are property taxpayers and so forth. And the, what has happened now is in this same way, we see them putting into effect cuts that they know cannot last. In other words, uh, we think it is designed to uh, really destroy, uh, in a sense, the program that we're trying to, to implement. And in putting these cuts in, this drastic cut that has been proposed in, in impact aid, which would do what you have said. We're hoping that the, that the congressman, uh, that in the budget committee, they will correct some of those things that have been done. And if not, then, as I said, we'll go along with uh, those congressmen, many of them Democrats, uh, who want to put in a substitute bill, and we would then they then meet the Senate bill in a conference committee. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you have to make a choice. Uh, on the current situation, how do you assess the current situation in Poland? And the second part of that is whether the warming up of relations, especially in the strategic military area with China, has any connection in your mind with events in Poland? No, I don't see any connection between China and what's going on in Poland. Um, I think the Poland situation is going to be very tense for quite some time now. The Soviet Union is faced with the problem of this crack in their once iron curtain uh, and what happens if they let it go but on the other hand uh, what is going to be the impact if they take a forceful action the impact on the rest of the world I think would be uh, tremendous in the reaction <laughs> no I know I can't I know I can't and I'm sorry for the rest of it okay Yes. Yes. <laughs> if O'Neill says you don't know anything about the working people, you have just a bunch of uh, wealthy uh, and uh, selfish advisors. One more. Just one more. <laughs> Wouldn't you know that Sam Donaldson would be the one? Sam's just quoted, why didn't you do that earlier? Said that Tip O'Neill has said that I don't know anything about the working man. I'm trying to find out something about his boyhood. Um, because um, uh, we didn't live on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, but we lived so close to them we could hear the whistle. <laughs>